Thank you very much. <coughs> Welcome to our talk. The name is quite long, Handling of Security Requirements in Software Development Lifecycle. And during the talk, we will try to explain what we actually mean by that. So, short introduction, this is me, this is how I look in a suit. We don't find me very often in, luckily. Um, I currently work for a company called One and One. Um, for those who have are a bit closer to Germany, you might have heard of Web.de, GMX.net, Mail.com. So um, this is a company which I work for and where I lead an application security team currently. So, and this is me, also in the suit. I'm also usually not wearing suits. Um, I've been in information security since five years. For the past four years, I've worked together with Daniel at one on one. And this year, I switched the company and I'm now working for Robert Bosch. Maybe you heard of them because they're currently in the news. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Did you improve the software? No, I wasn't working for them yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the usual excuse of a security guy if something yeah. goes wrong. I, they I didn't ask me anything. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with the, with the issues or what the problems are which we are trying to solve. Um, you might call these also challenges. Um, I might ask, who of you have ever done a penetration test? Couple of you. Who of you have done this repeatedly, so more than, let's say, two or three times? Still a couple of you. And um, those one who raised their hands, you might agree that Really, a lot of issues you find in the pandas are pretty much the same, right? So development teams keep doing the same mistakes. And these mistakes actually are sometimes pretty expensive to fix. And um, I think with the um, waterfall approach, um, it was more like these phases, you know, initiation, requirement definition, design, implementation, and so on. So uh, this type of development supported more, um, actually, also, let's say, some security processes. That's also the reason why still the most of SDLC uh, methodologies you will find in the wild, uh, they are targeting more for uh, waterfall. Now with the agile development, it's more like people um, have a look, try something, and then see, okay, it works and it did work. If it didn't work, it gets sometimes quite expensive for, for security. <coughs> and you see that um, they simply don't, don't learn from the, from the mistakes. So you see people um, doing the same stuff over again, so, which means for them it's more work. And for Pentester, it's less fun to test because you can't focus on the interesting stuff, but you keep assigning tickets or writing documents for the same issues. Next thing is, again, kind of um, connected or which got worse with the agile development, which is security documentation. So um, maybe some of you work in development companies and I won't even dare to ask how the security documentation look like because uh, people actually tend to not to write even normal documentation. So with, with, with many companies, so code is doc documentation, right? So not, not, not really helpful for, for all the cases. So basically, if you are trying to do like design assessment or anything like that, you come to a system and you have no idea how the system is built. That's pretty often. And also, if you find some documentation, sometimes it's like five years old, sometimes it's for the previous version or for previous system, so not helpful as well. And last thing is, and we actually had a chat about that with Martin just uh, before this talk a bit, is uh, that a lot of security consultants and companies, they are behind the tooling and processes used by um, development teams. So you have development teams with their issue trackers, uh, with all their tooling, Git, and so on. And then um, if you manage to push them to the state where they say, okay, I'm ready to give some time to a security consultant who is supposed to tell me how I should uh, write a secure application. And then this security consultant comes with PDF or with even a book. And you're trying, if you're developing yourself, you're trying to think, okay, how does this fit my processes? So if I want to create tickets out of this, am I supposed to write them by hand? Have fun with that. So um, basically there is a huge gap between these two words. 
As for the for the ideas, how we how we try to approach this um, with our company. First thing, critical. Um, now nowadays, everyone wants to be agile. If you develop yourself, you also know it's way more fun to develop agile. Just to give a shoot and see see we'll see what happens. So um, also we had a look at the tooling the devs use. So for instance, our company is a lot based on Jira, Git, and such things. Confluence, let's say, for documentation, and so on. so. Um, if you want to get to these people who develop stuff, you should be able to use the same tooling that's on their processes. So not to, again, as I mentioned before, you come to approach a development team and developing with, let's say, continuous delivery or, or Scrum or whatever, and you want to basically align to them because they are not going to wait for you because basically they are paid for the fact that their systems work, not that they are secure. Second thing, um, what is a um, really big challenge and where we also did some mistakes ourselves is um, basically the scalability. With, um, you have this famous fight between red and blue teams um, in the reality. So um, usually you have a huge company. Within a huge company you have tiny security department which is supposed to look all over the company what's happening there. On the other side you have the bad guys who have all the types of the resources they want and they are trying to find one single mistake you did. So um, how we approach this is that we have a role which we call security mentor and we have this role um, appointed in every single development team. So let's say on average our team has like let's say five to, to eight people and uh, one of these developers is taking care of the fact that everything what the team is doing, that application that my team um, gets on hold, that let's say if they need something from us, ticket is done, but nobody is developing under the radar. So that for we can, we, today we are quite confident that for 100% of our developing, we are developing with security in mind and from design, because there is one policeman taking care of, care, care of it. And if we, we used to find like one every now and then we used to find a project which managed it and then we approach it for the, with a the feedback loop. So we were very explicit that okay, this was a mistake, this is not supposed to, to happen. And actually nowadays we don't have these cases almost at all. So I hope that when I come back tomorrow to my work there will be not that one. And last thing is um, KISS, meaning keep it simple, stupid for the developers. Again, the developers are not paid for security in the, in the first place. They are paid for implementing the requirements they are going to do. So one of the first thing we did uh, before we actually developed a tool was that we um, started with OWASP SVS. Who knows SVS? Couple of you. So OWASP SVS, Application Security Verification Standard, um, it's basically almost 180 security requirements, which you go through one after another, um, usually during the QA phase, and check whether this requirement has been implemented or not. So uh, we started with ASVS uh, by then version one, and we talked to developers and tried to implement it into the design phase. So are you going to think about that? And Robert as well, we actually didn't think about it, but now we are going to do that. Then you come with a very similar requirement. So I don't know if you, if I get more technical, um, let's talk about uh, session parameters. So one requirement was, okay, are the, are the cookies protected by HTTP only flag? Okay, they're not like what they will be. Then there is, so there was second requirement, are they going to be protected with a secure flag? And I, yeah, okay, there'll be, I know there are more flags and we will take care of that. And then you ask them, okay, what about the expired state in, 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 in the cookie? So basically, one, there is not um, this connection one-to-one -one between actually the requirements in SES and the developers. And then if we go on, let's say you have a developer um, who is working on a mobile app. And so you go with your theory ASVS 
and say, okay, so um, how do you protect yourself against cross-site based forgery? And the developer goes, uh, not my problem. Okay, so um, next, next, next question. How do you input a validation? Information is done on the server side. Not my problem, again. And then, okay, what about your security headers? And he's like, okay, this is done on the server side. So we basically waste a lot of time of asking questions which do not make any sense to him, where you could save time. So um, the idea is that you need to be able to align to stuff the people are doing. So let's say based on parameterization. So we need to know, okay, you have a few group of developers. Some of them are doing SPAs. Uh, some of them are doing mobile apps. Some of them are doing backend and so on. And do you want to reach the correct requirements um, to, to them? So that's basically the homework you need to do before you go to them, because otherwise they won't um, get you seriously. Right? So and um, as we saw all these issues, that's why we got an idea to actually start deploy automation, <coughs> the Samsung idea. So developers use more and more automation, as I told before. Security is not up to date, so security should use automation as well, as much possible. And um, if it's possible, second big, big thing in the uh, rather proactive scenarios than the reactive, because the reactive can get expensive. So um, this is the workflow of our tool. So here on the left side, we have a security mentor. So as I said before, that's one role within the for development team. And here is security red. And the third thing the security <coughs> mentor tells to security red is what, you, what are you developing? So we have a couple of parameters. Like, for instance, we um, divide um, the application according to the criticality. So we have maybe some uh, blog uh, posts or some, let's like, say, static pages where, okay, if these get hacked, we look stupid, but we haven't lost any customer data. And um, on the other side, we have some central components, and if these are hacked, then basically all of us can go home. So it's, again, with limited resources, it's probably understandable that you want to um, um, spend different levels of energy on these. Next time will be, okay, are you developing mobile app? Are you developing, let's say, websites, whatever. And then the tool gives you the requirements which are relevant for you, which basically are in your company policy. And here you decide, okay, what are you, how are you going to approach these requirements? So, okay, this is fine, but this is handled by framework, so I don't have to do anything by that. Okay, here I need to implement a couple of thing, things and so on. Here I might not be implementing that because it's, Basically, way too expensive and it doesn't really fit. So you do you make this decision in design phase. And uh, what you do afterwards, you persist the state somewhere. So for this, as our company is based heavily on Jira, so we use Jira for that. And you will find out usually that a lot of these requirements you were talking about uh, produce actually tickets for, for the developers or for application security team. Um, so uh, why would you write them uh, by hand if you actually already have them in electronic forms? So you can, um, let's say, filter the tickets or the requirements according to different properties, and you can um, deploy them in different queues. So let's say for, um, for us, if we take a very simple example, we decide between so-called lifecycle and technical requirements. So lifecycle requirement is for us something what has to be done during the development of, 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 of the artifact. So let's say penetration test, code review, something like that. And uh, technical um, requirement describes actually the security of, of, um, of the artifact. So no SQL injection, stuff like this. So if you find out, okay, the technical requirements, you will usually create tickets for these in the queue of your development team. While the lifecycle requirements are usually done by my team, so my team gets, like, say, five tickets, which says, okay, we will need these five things for you. Um, and in the end, what is quite fun to do is actually some reporting, because you can always open the artifact which you stored in the asset queue and have a look, okay, even before you start working, uh, before, let's say, you were supposed to do a penetration test, you, you have a look at the artifact and say, 
okay, there were like 20 tickets to be done and I still see five tickets open. So why should I actually test this application already now? So what's going on here? Um, for the use cases, we basically um, use um, the tool in two main different scenarios. Um, one of them is, and that's the one where we get the most efficient, obviously, is when we are um, developing new artifacts. So somebody comes with the idea, okay, we need to deploy a new web service somewhere which does some crazy stuff. So in this, in this phase, when we know, okay, what the service is supposed to do, which technology is it, then we can go through the requirements and create tickets, by the way, um, just on the fly. And the development teams, or my team and so on, they will take care of it. Uh, what we also do, meanwhile, a lot, is that we do get analysis of the artifacts we have in our landscape. So we do a workshop where we say, okay, so this artifact hasn't been classified yet, uh, what type of application is it? And uh, then we talk to the team and say, okay, so what actually, what do you think at least is implemented by the, art by the, by the artifact? And then you get immediately very clear things, okay, like security headers, no, not implemented. Um, SQL, yeah, um, prepare statements are used completely and so on. With some parameters you say, um, no idea, we need to check. So you mark it in the, in the appropriate way. <coughs> and then um, we create tasks again for, for these requirements just to double check something or to implement something and try to get more secure. So basically, also if you have some, let's say, uh, experience from companies, you will find out that your legacy systems are actually the one because of them you can't sleep real well. So it's sensible to um, handle those as well. At the same time, it must be very clear that those are also the most expensive one to actually fix. If you have some legacy component where no one finds documentation for, no one finds uh, source code for, and so on, then uh, this might get entertaining. Okay, and now I will hand over to Rene to show you uh, the tool. Yeah, so it's time for a demo. Hopefully the Wi-Fi is stable here, fingers crossed. So because I'm actually doing a live demo from the internet. So let's show you Security Red. So this is the entrance page of our tool from Security Red. As Daniel already told you, we call everything an artifact here. So let's say we want to start a new application could be anything. So let's, we have to define a new artifact and a name for it. Let's just call it new app. And as Daniel told, we have a lot of parameters. This is how we scope the security requirements in the end. So first of all, we have criticality. So how critical is the app we are going to develop? Is it an, an application who maybe processes personal data? It might be more critical. Or if it's not, it's maybe just a low project. So let's assume it's a medium project and we have artifact type. What kind of application is it? Is it a front-end application? Is it a web service from the back end or is it maybe a mobile application? So for the um, demo, we are using a front-end application and for authentication, it just uses a single sign-on flight. Also, we have session management. So does your application um, have a session management? Yes or no? So we say yes, it has session IDs here. And what's the reachability of your application? Is it just for your internal company or is it just internal reachable? Or is it externally so it's internet facing so you have more risk that some hackers try to hack your application? Next thing is, uh, last thing is implementation type. So what's the type? Who's going to develop it? Is it internally developed by your own developers? Are you going to externally develop, develop it by a third company? Or is it externally developed and externally hosted maybe in the cloud? So let's assume we have an internal development project here. So I just hit generate. Now I receive a lot of data from the back end based on my parameters. And I, in the end, I have about 51 security requirements regarding to that project. So as we have a look, we can also see, okay, we have our new application. We have our parameters here. And what you're usually then doing is you just look, go with the lead architect and the lead developer through every requirement and ask them, okay, so those are is a life cycle requirement, point the security mentor role. Is that done in your project? And the architect will say, yes, it's done, it's John Doe. 
So we have John Doe as a security mentor. So he goes through the list. So you can say, okay, it's in implicit done because for every um, security requirement, we have here a, a road and where we have to specify for each requirement, how is this requirement done? Is it a task? So someone has to do something. Is it implicit solved because of third party framework? Is it refused because the developer says to you, no, I don't want to do that. I want to take the risk or clarify because we are not sure about that requirement or maybe it's really irrelevant. It doesn't concern us. So you go through the whole list. You see it's 51. Those are all lifecycle requirements. Here the technical requirements start. So the technical requirements are really requirements just for the developers. So we have here third party code is identified, checked for security vulnerabilities and its update process is defined. So the next um, column is we have a lot of information regarding this security requirements for the developer. Where can you find more examples for that requirement? So and let's say, okay, this needs to be clarified because we are not sure if the project is going to do that. Also for the next one, just for the demo, it's okay, this, this needs to be done. So the whole process is you're going through every security requirement and at the end you are finished and you need to save your artifact now. And as Daniel already told us, um, you need to export that to a queue you own. So we are using a Jira here. What we are doing now is we are creating a ticket in our Jira queue and we can specify uh, the issue type task we can even say we can assign it to to some person or we can say priority of that project is maybe highest those values are all coming from the Jira api we're just using the Jira api here so Jira is telling us what kind of fields are available so we need to persist it actually i'm just hitting export and we are now exporting to the Jira server server via the rest api can easily open that and have a look in the ticket so we know it's a new um, secure software development lifecycle called new app. We have the highest task because it's maybe critical. We have um, some explanation description text. And here we have actually a YAML file. There the whole project is persisted. And we're also adding some comments for it where you say, okay, you want to import it, the artifact, because you need to further develop it or you need to further clarify something. You can easy, easily just import it in our tool. So in it gets auto imported and you see this was what I've written there. What I have to say, the whole application is running on client side. It's not a server side application. Everything here is HTML5 and is stored in the browser in local storage. This is why we have to persist it in a ticket because from the backend, we only receive the security requirements. Everything we are doing here is done on the client side in the browser. This is why we have to save it. So. As I've told you, we are going through the whole list. We have defined a strategy for everyone. So let's say we want to filter for all things we need to clarify. I selected two requirements in the past we need to clarify. So those are tasks for, tasks for the developers now. So what we want to do is we want to select them all and we want them, want them assigned to the developers. So again, we just need a Jira queue. This can be a separate Jira queue. doesn't have to be the same instance. So again, we are just copying the URL of the Jira and say create tickets and say, okay, those are all say just bugs and we have to label it with a label, maybe, sorry, mis mistype clarify, but I want to write clarify here. Again, we can say it's a priority. Um, so it's the highest priority. And what's now <coughs> the tool is doing, it's doing um, a batch job for creating ticket. So for every requirement, we have, we have now created a single ticket and we can have a look at it and we see, okay, we have the name of our application, um, the description of the requirement, you see everything here, you see the whole requirement and you have the comment also, this needs to be done for the developers and it also relates to our project ticket. If you go back to our project ticket, um, where was it? So, let's go back to our project ticket here. Um, we also see in the project ticket that uh, another YAML file was saved because we are doing an auto save for every change if you're going to uh, create tickets. This is why we have another YAML file now here. And you see all the tickets are linked um, to the um, developer tickets we have opened here. 
So, and let's say, okay, this um, we can now also track the, the status. So let's say this ticket is now in progress. The de developer marks this is in progress. We're going to clarify it. Um, and let's open the, t um, the ticket again and importing it. Now we see as we have two attachment files in the ticket, two YAML files, um, we can import the newest one. We can easily say this one was created uh, 730C, 33 and 731. So we want to import the newest one because it actually contains our changes. So let's filter again on clarify. And what we see here now is we see the two tickets. They are linked in our tool to the according Jira ticket. And you also see the status of the ticket here. So for an architect or for a project manager, it's really easy to see now which tickets are fixed which tickets might be um, done by the develop developers but marked as won't fix. So we have to ask the developers what's wrong, why you want, don't want to fix that. So it's just that he can easily track changes here. What you also can use is um, you now have the requirements here and you say, okay, I want to talk with the developers um, above, uh, about those two tickets. So you can easily set up a meeting and say, okay, I, I need slides because everyone, everybody loves slides in a meeting. So let's create some slides. And you do not want to do this by hand because this, may, this is foolish and this ju will just cost you time to create slides. So what we can do, we just hit create slides, um, some presentation title, I'm the presenter, end page. I can um, select the theme if I want um, and all the descriptions and more information I want to include in my slide deck and just hit create slide. And what I get is a new slide set um, containing the requirements I've just selected secure architecture and you can easily go here and see this is a comment. So it really saves you time for the developers when you're going to talk to them. Same thing here for the second one and in the end, thank you, we are done. <laughs> Did you already get the requirement to create PowerPoint with this for management? No, PowerPoint is a proprietary... In all uh, your company? Huh? In your company? Uh, no, we use PowerPoint in the company of course, but we want to introduce it, yes? Can export this to PDF through LaTeX? Yes, you can do that if you want, but it's an open source project, so feel free. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, um, actually, this is based on Regal JS, some presentation framework, so yeah. there is, if you put in the URL or print PDF, then you actually can export PDF files from not in code region. So let's head back um, to our requirements here. Um, Let's say um, you're the developer and we are, you are discussing about a requirement and the developer says, come on, the description, it doesn't look good. I do not understand that. And also security requirements, they should live. They are not static. They change over time because you have new vectors, new attacks, stuff like that. So they should be dynamic. So you can easily say, um, give me, give some feedback for this requirement. And you can say, I don't like the motivation or I don't like the, the name and you just hit, I, don't, I want something changed. So, and by submitting, it will create a ticket in our queue because we are the owner of the tool and we receive the feedback. And we can now easily look at the feedback and say, okay, this was really so bad written from us, so we need to change the requirement. So, but as I've already explained to you, it's a client-side app, so everything is running on the browser. How can you change a security requirement and update it on the back end without projects never rece receiving it again? So, this is what I do now. I received the feedback and somebody told me, okay, um, the requirement description is wrong. I, don't, I do not understand that. So I'm actually an admin of the tool, so I see all the requirements here. This is why I can edit everything. So let's say the description is wrong, so I just add foobar here, because somebody suggested I like foobar in it. So what I do now is updating um, the requirement set on the back end. Give it some time. So this one is now updated. Um, as you see, here we have still, um, and it's, it's filtered. We have still uh, the wrong description. So we go back to our ticket, and what we do now is just where was actually the ticket? There it was. Um, we are just importing it, like we just opened the tool again. I'm um, importing the newest and some new button will pop up on the right side here and this says updates available. 
So what it does is it checks the back end if something has changed on the current requirement set um, this project has selected. So I would just <coughs> click on it, it will tell me, okay, one requirement were updated, nowhere added, nowhere removed. Because sometimes you all also can say, okay, this requirement is now obsolete, we don't need that anymore, you can delete it in the back end. So what, we, what you have now as a project manager, you have an easy view where it gets even highlighted where the change was in the new requirement. And you can either accept the change or you can also decline it if you want. So by just accepting it, you've updated your current requirement set and it will now save, uh, will be now saved again um, to the ticket you have. Also, what might change during uh, an, an development is because everybody is agile now. Um, maybe they say, oh, we don't have a front-end application anymore. Um, we now have also a web service. And it's not medium criticality anymore, it's also high. Because we changed everything, we are agile, we can do that. So what you can also do is now we're updating our artifact, but we do not want to lose our progress we've already done. So you can just easily update the artifact. And you will now say um, the update was successful. Um, we have nine new requirements because we changed our criticality from medium to high. And we now have requirements for the web service as well. So you see, everything is still in place. But we have just updated our artifact with new requirements because in an agile process something changed. So for the last one I want to show you is what's the time? Is the time fine? Okay, perfect. Um, but we also have just a quick one. As we are going to save everything um, um, in a queue, sometimes maybe your Firefox crashes, your computer crashes, or you just hit Alt and F4 and everything was shut down. So did you lose your changes? No, actually not. We are saving for every change you're going to make in the browser, we are saving everything in the HTML5 storage of your browser. So you can easily restore your previous session without losing anything because you have forgotten to save it in a queue. Each time you're saving your ticket uh, in the Jira server, the HTML, HTML5 storage will be purged for data security reasons because sometimes you're not sitting at your own laptop modifying something. This is why we purge it. So, but you can also purge it by hand and you can delete everything in your HTML5 storage. So for the last thing, what I want to show you is, um, again, it's a new app too. Um, we just leave the artifact properties as default. And what you've seen is here that we have an internal implementation type and an external. So what is the change between internal and externally? Because in internally you can easily assign tickets to your developers. But how do you do that with an external development? You can't um, create tickets for an external company. PowerPoint. Hmm? PowerPoint. No, don't use PowerPoint for that. <laughs> we, have, we have something It's similar to PowerPoint. Wait. So let's assume we have now 68 requirements. You've already seen that. So we are selecting, let's say we're selecting everything. We want to give it to an external company. So what is the second most used tool in companies instead of PowerPoint? Excel. Excel. You're right. And now, how about create an Excel file? So with status values, yes. And we're now creating an Excel file. So this is now an Excel file. You can easily give your external, comp external company. And the external company has to say, are they fulfilling the requirement? Yes or no, or partially, or it's unclear for them, or it's irrelevant. So, and they have to comment it, not sure, stuff like that. Okay, <coughs> to hit that on here. So, and it's not sure, and you can send it by mail, and you can receive it and can easily see, are they fulfilling your secu security requirements you, have to, uh, you gave them? That's where you actually usually want to uh, attach it to the contract. With the yeah, company, also, right? yeah. So that if you find this vulnerability, there's something in the handle that says, okay, you're supposed to fix it within one day. That's le can, legal that stuff. Can that import it back with the uh, uh, no, no. 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 Because <laughs> that's Excel, it's a proprietary format. It isn't that easy to read out. Mm -hmm. It's more easy to write in, but not read out. So, and for the last feature, this we this one we impl implemented in the last couple of weeks because... Sorry, that was a question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was my question as well. Okay. Uh, okay. They also usually, 
with this has more value for us because yeah. usually with the thing things you agree on the some company with the contract they don't change actually so instead of yaml to the ticket we attach the excel, um, uh, excel file to the kit and this is usually way more stable than the, your own development so on the last feature this one we developed just a couple of weeks ago because a lot of people were asking about um, do we have the possibility in your tool to show all the requirements which are currently in the database? Um, this is one you can easily see an overview here that currently in the database are 73 requirements we have um, and you see everything here and can view it easily. So let's hit back. Yes, yes, please. Uh, so you already have a database that the requirements in there, but so why don't you store the aspects? Because you don't want to store the artifact, because you want um, that your artifact can change over time. So uh, with storing everything in the in the database, you have to set up a like yeah, it's a storage and it's it's not agile in that case, because you have to persist everything in the database and have to um, how how are you going to handle authorization for that? Who is allowed to view that state in your mind? Is it the project manager? So Every project manager needs his own account for that. Um, how about a developer? He also wants to have a look at it, so you have to give him access to it. So in a database, in the end, in a huge company, you would have an authorization. It's such big of a table for a single project. It's the same as for Jira. Yeah, but in Jira you have easily groups. You have all the user management there. So Why not develop your own one? Jira is already there, actually. So you yeah. want to, depending on the queue, whether the people have rights to the queue yeah. or not, okay. you want to give them rights, okay, they can, they can see that or not. And all the changes I tried for seven. If you would say you're doing it yourself, you are doing the whole work again. So. I mean, we can do that, and in the end, we would have an enterprise software we could easily sell. The <laughs> big <laughs> oh, user management. Yep. How did you choose the security representatives, and did you experience situations when nobody wants to be the security representative? Will you answer? You are at one one currently with the uh, security yeah. mentors. Um, no, we didn't experience issues, and um, this was quite simple, basically. Um, if you have seen any other talk um, regarding SDLC, one of the first things the speaker um, always says is uh, sell it to the management. And that's completely true. So we have been um, earlier going through different parts of the company where there was different security awareness. And um, with the part of company where I'm working now, the CDO said, okay, security is our priority one. And show it in the PowerPoint to every, uh, every single person in Orhan's meeting. So actually, depends on our culture. I can imagine that in some companies, I would have really big problems with that. With our company, I went to the department managers and I told them, okay, am I, we actually don't scale. So we need these security representatives. And they were, okay, um, is it okay if I give you them next week because now they are on holiday and I would like to talk with them. But in this case, it will, it will be the most junior developer and say, okay, you are now security manager. It's fine. We help them. So basically the, how everybody learns, right? So we, usually we don't have junior developers having this role. But let's say if this happens, it's still fine because the, in the beginning, the security mentor is uh, responsible of nothing else than to making sure that everything goes to us. So that before, um, because in otherwise, um, uh, we would have to ask every team, what are you developing? What are you developing? And my team is um, taking care of 30 development teams. So we changed this and said, okay, you're the person. You, even in theory, it's not the case, but in theory, you don't have to have so much clue about security. But if there is anything going on, either you call or you open a ticket in our queue that you want to help with, so let's say, even going through the requirements. And then we happily assist them and teach them how to, how to go through this process. I think we should go for a round. What's the time? There's a clock over there. Yeah. yeah, and we are five minutes past. No, 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 we are with like 10 until 8, right? No, oh, I'm not <laughs> Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, just uh, for me, some uh, internals about the technical <coughs> stuff. Um, what we are using in the tool, our tool is based on J Hipster. Has any one of you heard J Hipster? 
It's the really newest and coolest and hippest, and I don't say the next word. Uh, and also, um, I want to show you something. That I go over that very quick now. It's a database scheme we are using. So um, first of all, we have requirement skeletons. For us, requirement skeletons are just a short name and a description. And um, based on the requirement skeletons, we have option columns where you have more information for every requirement. You can easily add that. You can easily say you can easily extend your option columns with alternatives like um, here we have a requirement like that one um, for SQL injection. And I know the project is using Java, the developers, so I can easily add here directly code in the in our in our tool how to show the developer how he's going to secure against SQL injection with prepared statements. So the developer really receives here a trusted code base you can just easily copy instead of going to Stack Overflow and copying the code there, which is usually pretty unsafe. So next thing is the status columns I already showed you. So we have two types of status columns. We have um, enumeration status columns here with the strategy and the fulfilled by external developments. And we have a free text for comments. And also we have an implementation type you can easily change like internally, externally, but you can easily change everything in the applications with the admin interface. Nothing is bound here. What you see is just what we inputted in the database, but you can change everything. Nothing is fixed here. And of course, the collections with criticality system type, but you can easily change it to the ones according you want. And also text, I didn't show that because it's more or less more filtering on the requirements on the view. You can easily, um, usually, um, you have some kind of phases in your development project in big companies. You can easily filter here for initiation phase, design phase, coding phase. It's more or less a few, uh, filtering on the few. Um, also, authentication. Um, what you see, I was already authenticated against our tool. We are currently supporting two authentication schemes. First of all, we have our own authentication scheme. It's form-based with our user management in our database. It's just a local user management in the back end. But we are also supporting a CAS, a central authentication service. Um, usually big companies are using, so you don't need a local user management in the tool. Just point um, in the security red configuration file to your CAS server and you already get authenticated through the CAS server your company is using. Also roles for authorization. We have three roles currently. It's the front end user. The front end user only sees the requirements and can change them and can save them. We have a normal user. The normal user sees the requirements and can also change the requirements on the database in the back end. And of course, there's an admin user who can do everything and he can also delete and create users. And the Jira integration I've shown you, we have currently. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jira. Martin is, I already heard. I said no. <laughs> So um, Jira, is, it's not easy to integrate with Jira because um, the cross-origin request sharing header has to be set on the Jira server, cross headers, because Security Red um, is actually inheriting the user's rights um, to post to the Jira URL. So if, you're, if you are not allowed to post to Jira, Security Red is as well, isn't as well. So you need to have access right to Jira, otherwise it won't be possible to create a ticket from Security Red. And now I hand back over for the last minutes. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so this was the current state uh, we are at. Of course, we have a um, huge bunch of plans I to present very shortly. Just um, for the first time, <coughs> we presented this too. It was on the EPSEC EU in Rome. And there we named uh, three things which were in development. So the first thing was own user management, which has been now implemented. Second thing was uh, documentation. So um, you can already find uh, GitHub pages, securityred.github.io, <coughs> where you will find out how to install it yourself and so on, how to use it. And um, third thing was a Docker container, all in one, so that maybe you want to download it and you want to play around. So we have this as well. So that's our current state. Um, what we need to look into or what we want to look into in the following months are the requirements themselves. So uh, the idea is that 
basically every company is different, has different processes, different policies, different requirements. So um, usually you will currently um, start from scratch. So you will get an empty tool and say, okay, this is my policy, how I want to organize the requirements. Um, as there are a couple of security standards in place, we want to use them. There might be organizations which adhere to them and also uh, have a look at how can we parameterize them. So right now, um, we uh, have been offering, let's say, something like default requirement set, which is like like custom version of requirements, which might be helpful, but um, to be honest, this maybe needs a bit more more love so so that it's it's more usable. So um, what is also a challenge for us, um, you in the beginning, you want to get as secure as possible. So you will end up with many requirements. Like I think first version in my company was 200 requirements. And then you come to the development team and say, okay, so let's do a workshop and you show them these 200 requirements. You're not going to get many friends. So that's, it's basically a um, file which is going to last forever to be as effective as possible. So to, okay, if we haven't used some requirements, we will um, smash it out. We might add some other requirements. We might have a look how we want to group the requirements. Um, what we are not very good at is um, some language uh, language code patterns, examples, technology, and so on. So right now we are very um, generic for, for the moment with the requirements that we, we offer. Um, next part, as I was talking in the beginning about um, your development teams use um, different tooling. So let's say for the moment we are integrating with uh, Jira and we have basically three use cases for that. Um, one of them is um, um, exam saving of the artifact itself. Another one is uh, creating the tickets and third one is uh, sending the feedback as Rene showed you. Uh, but let's say maybe you don't want to store this artifact information in Jira, but you want to store it in GitHub with your artifact. So this will be, or maybe you want to uh, store it in Wiki or Confluence or whatever you're using for your technical documentation. The same time, if you uh, um, if you are getting a feedback for for a requirement, again you might not want to store it in Jira, but maybe send it to HipChat or Slack or whatever. So um, this would be for us the area, of course. There are also different issue trackers than than Jira, so um, this uh, would be um, the idea. Um, next part of integration, which is currently planned, is um, test our testing tools. Because uh, we, um, right now, we are handling the proactive phase, um, but what we would like to do is to give the developers um, the possibility to say, okay, I think I might have implemented the requirement X, Y, Z. So check it. So, and in this case, the developer doesn't want to open a ticket in your, in your queue because then he has to wait till your team has resources. Um, he also doesn't want to run burp or zap or whichever scan because it gives you such a report and which you don't understand anyway. So you want a very fast feedback loop. Is it, was it successful or not? Or try again. So that would be, that's, that's something we are starting um, from the beginning, from the next month. Probably um, developing of another tool which integrates with Security Red and let's say enhancing the Security Red family. Uh, but the uh, architecture is still not quite clear for, for the moment. Um, and uh, for the moment, basically there are three people involved um, in uh, Security Red. So um, it's, you see two of them and we work on it basically in our weekends and evenings. And then there is uh, one working student on my, on my team. So um, I think there is, we have achieved quite a lot with that, but we could definitely achieve more if there were more people implementing issues. So that's why also in the last month, we uh, put a lot of attention to getting more transparent, doing documentation, really having um, GitHub issue for everything we do. We already got some cooperation, some, some guy implemented um, was it Ansible Kubu for, for in the manager and security rest. So there are some first um, say people um, getting onboarded and we hope to attract more people as different companies um, need different things and uh, there are a couple of ways how to integrate. Of course what's awesome are pull requests. So if you fork and let's say okay there's issue 
or I have an idea how to make it better, and then you say, okay, you could, you do it for your company, and then you contribute back so that everyone will get it. Maybe not um, everyone wants to contribute back, so even like feel free to use it and adapt it to to your needs. It's uh, it's really much um, cool as well. Maybe you give feedback. This works for me. Um, also, testing is interesting for us uh, because, especially as uh, Renato, right for instance, integration with Jira, this is a real challenge. You will find always new uh, new issues where you think, okay, is it Jira issue or is it my issue? Different scenarios. So even something that something worked or didn't work for you is very um, is awesome for us. And um, if you even don't want to test or get your hands dirty, just simply tell us or the others which features are interesting for you. So that we can also prioritize or say, okay, um, this is a good idea, we will prioritize it ourselves and implement it. And um, that will be it. Thank you very much for coming. This is the address where you will find more information. And now we might be open for one or two questions.